there we are. And as I intimated earlier, and as the uh, Dalek voice just confirmed, um, we are indeed recording this. And afterwards, we'll be sharing slides. In terms of questions, yeah, feel free to put questions in the chat, and we'll have a we'll try and treat them up at the end. Um, if we don't have time, and this is quite a short compressed session, um, we, we we will probably circulate something in writing. Um, but I think it's best that we keep the questions in in writing in order to maintain control over over things. Okay, great. So to start off with, yeah, so the NBA 2022, as we might say, Starlet, um, is now uh, increasingly commencing. Um, there, there, there's certainly two commencement orders. They, they, who knows? Maybe there's even a third one by now. But so far, the, the, the most important commencement provisions are those found in Section 87, i.e. the, the, the pre-commencement regime, which introduced some provisions on enactment and many more provisions on 28th of June 2022. Additionally, since then, the first commencement order um, introduced a further set of provisions coming into force as the year has moved on. So if you want to know exactly when something uh, entered force, and we do, we do address it in our various slides, but bear in mind, you can always look at the latest commencement order, yeah? The latest commencement order will usually, well, I think always, give the dates of, of, of the provisions, not only which it is commencing, but also the provisions that other instruments have commenced. But anyway, generally speaking for now, you can look things up in either section 87 and the latest commencement order. Um, okay, so part 11 immigration rules have significantly changed in the course of this year, major changes in June, 2022, in, in particular to implement two of the big policy intentions that run with the statute. Uh, one is to give force to the differentiated, or we might even say discriminatory regime for refugees, depending on their style of travel or timing of asylum claim in the UK. Uh, and, uh, and also, <laughs> in fact, the two things I'm saying are in fact both part of the same broad point, also to um, introduce a, a double whammy of, of problems for those individuals. Firstly, on family reunion. Secondly, in accessing settlement. So those are the major refugee-specific changes that we've seen in, in the rules this year. <laughs> OK, just overview of the protection claim changes in terms of things that are already in force now, mostly introduced on the 28th of June. Differential treatment, um, scope for different treatment of, of accommodation of asylum seekers, that's all being introduced by regulation, so we can't really see its detail yet, but the regulations are like are on foot now, and at any time we're going to start seeing um, new support and accommodation regulations, which may well change the way in which um, those kinds of JRs operate, if that's the kind of casework that you do. Uh, we see a new designated place for asylum claims, which is which is defined mainly now in the statute, and that in turn heralds a validity regime. I suppose, really, for the first time for asylum claims. Previously, it's been other kinds of migrants who have been bedeviled by um, the prospect of invalidity. But now, if your asylum claim isn't adequately made, including being too vague, in either of those scenarios, it could be deemed invalid and therefore not get off the ground with all the practical problems that might ensue. Um, other matters I'm going to deal with in more detail shortly as the slides proceed. Um, OK, so the, the general features of this new regime are firstly that refugee law continues its journey. You know, refugee law has, has uh, whilst not changing itself, is like a chameleon. The environment around it has kind of changed um, and the, and the colour of the legal provisions has changed along with the environment. So only two years ago, it was EU law. Now, uh, then for two years or so, it was EU retained law as of this summer. It's become pure domestic law. And that may matter because decisions of the Court of Justice will be of diminished significance. Historic decisions will probably be pretty important. Future decisions will be of diminished importance, but nevertheless still relevant. Huge issue I'm going to come on to in a bit of detail in a moment, standard proof for assessing past facts. Also, the refugee definition is generally domesticated now and placed into different provisions of this legislation. One thing that isn't there, though, 
a very important omission. Despite heavy pressure, um, the government refused to express Refugee Convention compliance on the statute book. The House of Commons considered that the provisions are compliant with the Refugee Convention and it's not necessary to provide expressly that this is so. Important, of course, because it means they can't really be held to account by the step by pure Refugee Convention standards as a matter of parliamentary sovereignty. Uh, transitional arrangements, these arrangements are not, well, they're, they're, they're hinted at in the legislation um, in terms of it, it bites on post 28th of June 2022 claims. That's not difficult to understand. More difficult to, or more in, involved is, is, is the transitional policy, which basically says that if you're trying to claim asylum before commencement, um, but you're given a date after commencement, I saw that a Scottish case came online a few weeks ago saying that there could be a 20 week delay on just registering an asylum claim at the moment, so that could really matter. You'll still be treated as a pre 28th of June claim, so long as you attend the scheduled appointment or any rescheduling. And if you miss it um, with, without good reason, you'll be in the new regime. So actually there could be a real battle now uh, to make sure we don't miss appointments and to make sure that a good explanation is given if someone does miss an appointment because going into the modern regime is going to be a lot more heartache than its predecessor. Okay first the big issues I'm going to deal with um, is the uh, discrimination regime so we have a new we have a section um, 12 and a section 37 of the legislation that, that, that basically deals in some detail with um, differentiation of refugees. And the point of this regime is, as I've already indicated, it allows for discrimination vis-a-vis -vis family reunion and access to settlement. Um, it's going to cut across previous judicial decisions, Adimi most famously, where a fairly generous approach was taken to the protection given to Article 31 of the Refugee Convention, recognising as per the UN Secretary General's comment on screen that um, it would be difficult for a person in flight to comply with the requirements for legal entry into a country of refuge. Here is Article 31. Contracting states shall not impose penalties on account of their illegal entry or presence on refugees who coming directly from a territory where their life or freedom is threatened, enter or present in their territory without authorization, provided they present themselves without delay to the authorities and show good cause for their legal entry or presence. By breaking that down, it's a proviso which prohibits penalties which are due to illegal entry or presence on refugees coming directly from the territory of feared persecution, who enter or are present without authority, who provided they present themselves without delay and they show good cause for their illegal entry or presence. And so what this legislation does um, is basically address uh, the meaning of these terms in some detail. Adimi had come up with a generous approach about how there's an element of choice open to refugees about where they properly seek asylum. Short term stopovers en route wouldn't deprive them of Article 31 protection. Um, the reasons, you know, e e even a substantial delay in a third country could be reasonable if it was spent acquiring the means of traveling on. Uh, presenting yourselves without delay, so long as you claim asylum within a short time of arrival. Good cause. You know, really, the, the, the Court of Appeal played this down in Adimi and said that it was um, it played any a limited role. Or well, actually, I think it was the Adimi Court who determined the Divisional Court who determined Adimi. OK, so then, of course, the next stage in the Article 31 journey in our domestic legislation was Section 31 of the 99 Act, which created a statutory defence uh, to put Adimi thinking on the statute book and prevent prosecution of refugees for uh, these kinds of misdemeanors. And, and Section 31 is narrower than Adimi suggested it had to be because Section 31 focuses on certain misbehaviors, forgery, identity, deception, document falsification, rather than any criminal offense. Um, but no, they, they say the definition in Section 31 of the 99 Act of, um, of domestic protection against criminal sanction and so forth and other penalties uh, essentially it was for someone who claimed comes to this country without delay shows good cause makes an asylum claim as soon as reasonably practicable in terms of coming directly i.e third country behavior has to show they could not reasonably have been expected to give protection under the refugee convention elsewhere 
um, and, and, and subsequent case law in, in, the, in the criminal court of appeal has run with Adeemi and not really shaken, shaken its thinking. Um, so the new legislation um, is, is, is obviously uh, a potential threat to um, this thinking, the Adeemi thinking, and, 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 and could mean that Section 31 is approached rather differently, or at least it's um, Article 31 protection is accessed differently for asylum seekers who are Group 1 as opposed to Group 2 refugees, as we'll see in a moment. Um, now, the statutory language of the, of the new legislation isn't massively different from Adeemi, some would say. Uh, the, the government plainly think it is, but as a matter of reading it, it's not that different. And so the, the numerous higher authorities um, from, from the Supreme Court and so forth, saying that legislative provisions which are ambiguous, ambiguous need to be interpreted uh, in a way that doesn't involve international treaty obligation breach, will be very important. Any vagueness and claimant lawyers are going to be saying that ambiguity should be construed in favour of refugee convention compliance. And of course, Adimi and the criminal court of appeal cases that followed it are the ultimate source of what the international law meant in the first place. Here's a new legislation defines group one refugees and group two refugees. Group one refugees are the people who've complied with the following criteria. 2A, coming to the UK directly from where your life or freedom is threatened. 2B, presenting yourselves without delay to the authorities. Three, if you've entered unlawfully, you have to show good cause for that unlawful entry or presence, which means uh, not, not requiring leave to enter and not having it, i.e. the usual definition of unlawful presence that we see in the rest of the Immigration Acts. Section 37 uh, runs with Section 12 and also addresses immunity from penalties. A refugee is not to be taken to have come to the United Kingdom directly from a country where their life or freedom is threatened. If in coming from that country, they stopped in another country outside the UK, unless they can show that they could not reasonably be expected to have sought protection under the Refugee Convention in that country. Uh, so notice a slight change in the focus there in terms of things going on in the third country. It does rather use the Adimi language of stop, stop over and so forth. Um, but it talks about reasonably be expected to have sought protection as opposed to reasonably be expected to have received protection had they sought it, which is more the Section 31 formulation. And you know, these words could really matter, yeah, because, um, you know, we're talking about whether or not someone ends up in the wrong lane of the refugee motorway. You know, if a group two refugee is going to have a much worse time in terms of access to settlement and family reunion. Where will all this stuff be litigated and debated? Well, of course, it, it, in one sense, it, it's likely to crop up in the original asylum claim and its judicial or administrative decision making. But, you know, um, in a tangential way, because the Home Office may make findings, so much as they ever make findings, or judges may make findings, of course that's more their job, um, and those findings may impinge on these issues, even though one might have been rather oblivious to that going on at the time, because of course in the application appeal system, one is primarily focused on gaining status, not on these, you know, in a sense, side issues. Okay, section 37.2, a refugee is not to be taken to a presented themselves without delay, unless um, for someone who became a refugee outside the UK, i.e. a traditional refugee, the normal refugee, someone who fled their country with their asylum claim extant, um, they have to make a claim for asylum as soon as reasonably practicable. Whereas, whereas for surplus refugees, those who became refugees whilst in the United Kingdom, uh, then if at the moment their asylum claim crystallised, if they were lawful at that moment, then they basically have until their lawfulness ends to claim asylum. Yeah? So a student or visitor has until the end of their leave in terms of Section 37 um, protection. O of course, that, that, we all know that's not going to impress the Home Office in terms of the substantive asylum decision, but nevertheless, in terms of the penalty regime, um, it, it, it's a differentiation. And then the other limb, 2B2, if their presence in the UK was unlawful at the time the surplus claim arose, 
they have to make a, a claim as soon as reasonably practicable after becoming aware of their protection needs. And, and lawfulness has the same definition as, as is usual. Okay, so um, the group one refugees are those who come to the UK direct and present themselves without delay, reasonable expectation of asylum, of, of, of claiming asylum uh, being, the, being the test. So all kinds of stuff is going to be relevant about being under the control of an agent, being fearful because of your experiences of authority, <laughs> relationships between the transit country and the country of origin, perhaps colonial relationships, all kinds of things. I mean, it, it is voice, some degree at least, but at least potentially subjectively. So, you know, it'd be quite interesting um, litigation to be had on this, I've no doubt. Um, the, 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 the good cause issue, less apparent scope for, for debate on that, um, but we'll see how it, how it turns out. So anyway, those are the good guys. Timely asylum claim having flitted briefly across third countries, and then the bad guys are going to be the group two refugees. So how is this differentiation worked out? Um, it, it's done so by the refugee permission to stay regime and the refugee temporary permission to stay regime. So uh, part 11 of the rules, this is not, I've got to say, this is not the most transparent articulation they could have come up with of these ideas, but it is there. You need to use control F in my experience quite a lot in part 11 of the rules to um, look up particular concepts. And after a while, it all sort of becomes clear, hopefully. So anyway, rule 339 QA little one, tells us that group one refugees get five years refugee permission to stay. Yeah, so that's our PTS is, is what group one people get. Um, group two refugees get um, 30 months um, refugee temporary permission to stay. So really actually my slide should say RTPTS to be clear on that. So that's a differentiation. Another thing is that the refugee regime now says that um, extension application should be made within 28 days of your permission uh, being due to expire. Okay, so there's the new there's there's the new regime. Yeah, um, point to make about it. Uh, ministerial statement here um, of, of discretion might be exercised uh, where a person is unable or unwilling to present timorously due to sexual violence, or for those not in control of their actions in the case of trafficking minors and others. Interesting. I mean, the Hansard puts this as discretion, but it's not really discretion at all. This is a, a, a judgment by a decision maker um, about whether or not certain criteria are satisfied or not. So it's not really right to talk about discretion. I mean, maybe that's how the Home Office sees it, but I don't think that's how the statute sees it. Um, and another point is that the legislation itself, uh, sorry to be dizzying in terms of going through it, um, but just, just going back a bit here, section 37, all these questions are posed, you will notice, um, in terms of the lang of, of a pure statutory test. None of these tests, not in 31, here's 32, not in 30, in, in, here's 37 too. Um, none of these tests refer to in the opinion of the Secretary of State. So on JR, it seems possible that the court, the tribunal, is going to have to make up its own mind about these issues and therefore it will have more the feel of an age assessment JR than it does of a fresh claim JR, perhaps. Okay, that's the first two point. I'm badly running out of time, yeah. Um, so I'm gonna leave this now and go very quickly to the new credibility provisions for substantive asylum determination. Um, relevant behavior that deciding authority thinks is not in good faith in terms of your general conduct with the Home Office and in any other litigation, e.g. telling uh, porky pies in JR proceedings or not paying your costs, et cetera, all that kind of collateral stuff is now another reason to disbelieve your asylum claim. But the big one, of course, is the standard of proof. Uh, and now the important thing is that this is now glossed by quite a lot of Home Office policy. So as we've seen across this year's development, Section 32 of the legislation creates a balance of probabilities test for something. What? Firstly, convention reason. Secondly, whether in fact the asylum seeker does fear such persecution. Those questions will be determined on balance of probabilities, yeah? One, convention reason. Two, fear. Other questions are on the lower standard of proof um, of reasonable degree of likelihood. 
So there's the exact statutory language on the balance of probabilities. Having a characteristic, which is then the convention reasons to be um, whether or not you actually have the fear. Second one, slightly more uh, ambiguous, right? Because it doesn't say historical facts. It does not say historical facts are to be determined on balance of probabilities. Clearly, when we look at the Home Office guidance, though, they're going to apply it to the determination of historical facts. Someone, someone might have the pluck to challenge this on the basis that that's not a given, yeah? The question of fear is perhaps not the same as the question of, are you telling the truth? Maybe it's the question of your psychological reaction to your situation. We'll have to see how that goes. Uh, then determining, once, once, once um, fear and convention reason, reason are determined on balance of probabilities, we go to other issues, state protection, persecution and internal relocation are all to be determined on real risk standard. Persecution and state protection, probably not a problem because the facts will have been found by now. And the question is, how bad is it? If it's bad, then it's persecution. Are the authorities going to help you or not? Again, the narrative will have been assessed by now. But internal relocation, interestingly, yeah, internal relocation can itself involve fact finding, e.g., do you have family in Kabul? Um, will you be able to find work in Baghdad or register a, C a, a CSIC card or whatever? Um, CSIB card, <laughs> all those kinds of things. So now there's going to be a whole melange of, of issues for dizzied Home Office re refusal letter writers and poor, confused first tier tribunal judges to package up what issue am I dealing with uh, on what standard of proof? Um, yeah, here's a big issue, right? Um, Whereas it's clear from the credibility and refugee status guidance post 28th of June 2022, note the title, right? There are now four um, long documents, refugee post 28th, pre 28th June, humanitarian protection post 28th, pre 28th June. And you know, these, these regimes set out quite rad radically different um, methods for assessing cases and processing asylum and HP claims. Big thing about HP, right, is that the, the facts are to be determined on the lower standard, lower standard of proof. So for years now, for ever since 2006, one has been happily being able to have a, you know, at the end of the hearing in the FTT, the judge says, oh, of course, your humanitarian protection claim stands and falls with the asylum claim, doesn't it? And that would be a right thing to say, because normally there's no difference between them, except for convention reason, and possibly some little nit nitbits about uh, exclusion. Totally different regime in the future, yeah? Your humanitarian protection claim no longer stands and falls with a refugee claim because it is still to be determined on a low standard of proof. You'll see in the Home Office guidance that, um, that there's all kinds of stuff about still giving the benefit of the doubt to asylum seekers, which will itself create all kinds of litigation potential because you wouldn't expect the benefit of the doubt to be given on the balance of probabilities. Okay, I'm gonna stop because I've kind of overshot my mark somewhat. I'm going to hand over now to Raza. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, I'm going to go to deal with third country removals. And hopefully it's going to. Has that come up for everyone all right? I think so. Yeah, great. Thanks, Mark. Um, so. Dealing with third country removal, there are several aspects of the 22 Act that significantly change the law on safe third country removals. And the most startling aspect of the 22 Act, um, uh, uh, safe third country provisions, is Schedule 4. And this schedule essentially gives the Secretary of State carte blanche to remove an asylum seeker to a third state without first deciding their claim. And so a person can be removed to a third state if it is a place where a person's life and liberty isn't threatened by a convention reason, or they won't be removed elsewhere other than in, in, in accordance with the convention, or it's a country to which a person can be removed without their Article 3 rights being breached or in contravention of those rights. And the person mustn't be a national or citizen of the state in question. 
Now, and Schedule 4 to the 22 Act intersects with the existing certification powers in Schedule 3 to the 2004 Act. So there are still many interlocking provisions that you've got to look at, notwithstanding the great promises that this would be a, a, a kind of one-stop shop. Um, now, going to um, the purposes of the of Schedule 4 to the, of the 22 Act, the countries that are listed in Part two and three of Schedule three to the 2004 Act are presumed and apparently irrebuttably to be places where a person's life and liberty aren't threatened by, uh, for a refugee convention reason, and where a person won't be removed elsewhere other than in, in accordance with the refugee convention. Uh, it's also rebuttably presumed that there are countries, uh, they are countries to which a person can be removed without their Article three rights being breached and from which a person will not be sent to another state in contravention of their convention rights. And the countries listed in part two uh, currently include all EU and EEA countries in Switzerland. And currently there are no countries listed in part three. Uh, I'm just gonna pause there to, to, to say that these, because of the shortness of time, I've, I, and I'm going at quite some speed, these slides are, uh, pretty comprehensive and they say much more than I normally would so hopefully if, if anything is missed because of speed you, you'll you get copies of the slides afterwards for those who would um, like them. Um, and then so to continue countries that are listed in part four to schedule three of the 2004 act are presumed again irrebuttably to be places where a person's life and liberty are not threatened for a refugee convention reason and where a person will not be removed elsewhere other than in, in accordance with the Refugee Convention. Um, there is no presumption with respect to breaches of convention rights in those countries, but currently there are no countries listed in part four. So Schedule 4 to the 22 Act also makes various amendments to Schedule 3 to the uh, 2004 Act. Uh, in particular, it abolishes the limited out of country appeal rights that previously existed for those certified under that schedule. Now, although schedule four was widely described as offshore processing during the passage of the 22 act through parliament, uh, that was actually a misnomer and it's not a phrase uh, offshore processing that's used in the act. Um, it doesn't provide for the UK to process a person's asylum claim in a third country Rather, it simply provides for the summary removal of an asylum seeker to a third country. Now, this is a point that was, in my experience at least, rather missed by anyone outside of not only the most recently the Rwanda litigation, but indeed many outside um, the legal profession. Most people had understood, perhaps for, for, for looking at the Australian model and perhaps for those who were listening avidly to parliamentary uh, debate, that, Rwanda, that third countries were simply going to be used like Manus Island for processing. Um, and as we know, that is not the case. Rather, it provides for the summary removal, as I say, uh, of an asylum seeker to third country. And once they're removed, their asylum claim will be dealt with under the third country's laws, and the UK won't necessarily play any continuing role. So it follows that they will not necessarily, asylum seekers won't necessarily enjoy the full panoply of protections that they would enjoy in the United Kingdom if the United Kingdom doesn't play any ongoing part in the uh, asylum determination process. Uh, and another striking feature of Schedule 4 is that it does not require that a person's asylum claim first be declared inadmissible, which is a topic I'm, I'll, I'll discuss uh, in a moment, before they can be removed to a third country. In principle, it allows the Secretary of State to remove any asylum seeker to any third state that meets the conditions. Now at present, the Secretary of State's policy is to select asylum seekers for removal to Rwanda only if their asylum claims are inadmissible and they've made a quote, dangerous journey to the UK on or after the 1st of January 22. And you've got the reference uh, there in the sub bullet. Pausing there, it's to be noted that Schedule 4 was not yet in force when the implementation of the Rwanda plan uh, commenced. It came into force on the 28th of June this year. And given the stated purpose of the Rwanda plan it is to deter irregular journeys to the United Kingdom from France, it may be likely that the Secretary of State will continue to select people 
for the Rwanda scheme on the basis of their having made such journeys. However, Schedule 4 doesn't require her to do so because, as I said at the outset, it gives her carte blanche to remove any asylum seeker to any third state that will accept them with no statutory preconditions. So turning then to inadmissibility, now prior to the 28th of June, an asylum claim would be held inadmissible under paragraphs 345A to D of the immigration rule. So this is a bit of a kind of history lesson just to remind ourselves of where we were so that we can see where we are now. And the criteria for holding a person's claim inadmissible were that they'd been recognized as a refugee in a third country and could still avail themselves of the protection of that third country or they otherwise enjoy sufficient protection in the third country, including benefit, benefiting from the principle of non-reformant, um, and that they could enjoy sufficient protection in a third country, including benefiting from the principle of non-reformant because they'd already either made an application for protection there, or they could have made an application for protection, but didn't, but there were no, and there were no exceptional circumstances that prevented them from making an application like that or that they had a connection to that country, and so it'd be reasonable for them to go there to obtain protection. So the position previously for those purposes was that a country was a safe third country for a particular asylum seeker if their life and liberty were, would not be threatened on account of a refugee convention reason in that country, uh, the principle of non refoulement would be respected in that country in accordance with the refugee convention, the prohibition of removal in violation of the right to freedom from torture and cruel and inhumane degrading treatment as laid down in international law and Article 3 obviously was respected in that country and the possibility existed to request refugee status and if found to be refugee to receive protection in accordance with the Refugee Convention in that country. And the Secretary of State would admit an inadmissible asylum claim for consideration of the claim in the UK if either removal to a safe third country within a reasonable period of time was unlikely, or upon consideration of a claimant's particular circumstances, the Secretary of State determined that the removal to a safe third country was inappropriate. So that was the position as it was. And the 22 Act establishes a new inadmissibility regime in sections 80, capital B to C of the 22 Act, and that's inserted by, sorry, of the 2002 Act, I'm sorry, as inserted by Section 6 of the 22 Act. And that came into force in on the 28th of June uh, and is materially different from the paragraph 345A to D regime. And, and in short, a person's asylum claim is treated as inadmissible if one of the five conditions applies. And I've set them out in the slide. And that's either they've been recognized as a refugee in a safe third country or remain able to access protection there. Uh, they've, uh, they've been granted protection in a safe third state, in which case, uh, as a result of that, they won't be sent to another state other than in accordance with the Refugee Convention or in breach of their Article 3 rights. And they remain able to access that protection in that country. Third condition is they've made an asylum claim that hasn't yet been determined or refused. Fourthly, they were previously present in and eligible to make an application for protection in a safe third state, and it would have been reasonable for them to expect to expect them to do so, and they failed to do so. And fifthly, in their particular circumstances, it would have been reasonable to expect them to have made an asylum claim uh, to a safe third country instead of making it in the UK. So it, it can be seen that although these are broadly similar to paragraphs 345A to D, they are not identical. And in particular, whereas an asylum seeker who'd passed through a third state but had not claimed asylum there previously had to show that there were exceptional circumstances, quote, preventing them from claiming asylum. They now need to only, they now only need to show that it was not reasonable to expect them to do so. Now, a safe, what is a safe third state for the purposes of sections A to B to C? And that, that's defined as a state where a person's life and liberty aren't threatened by reason of refugee convention reason and from which a person won't be sent to a th another state otherwise than in accordance with the Refugee Convention or in contravention of Article 3 rights, and in which a person may apply to be recognized as a refugee if they're recognized, received protection there. 
Now, if a person's claim is inadmissible, it ordinarily won't be considered. And then a decision to declare a claim inadmissible is not a decision to refuse the claim for the purposes of Section 82, uh, one of the 2002 Act. And so it generates no right of appeal. Um, now, the Secretary has a discretion to consider the asylum claim if she determines that there are ex exceptional circumstances in the particular case that mean that the claim should be considered, or in other cases, as are provided for in the rules. Now, it's not clear yet whether inadmissibility and removal to a, a, a third state is a, quote, penalty imposed on account of illegal entry or presence for the purposes of Article 31, which Mark went through in, in some detail and uh, provided very important context for, uh, I should say, this Article 31 of the Refugee Convention. However, that may make little difference in practice because the reasonable to expect test in Section 80C is closely aligned with the Article 31 test as reinterpreted by Section 37 of the 22 Act. Now, um, this is all, those of you who have cases involving the Rwanda scheme will be very familiar with um, th this territory and whether or not, not simply the penalty point, but also um, how the inadmissibility decisions are framed and how they um, sit alongside human rights um, refusals. So moving then on uh, to my final uh, uh, two slides, which is just to do, or three slides to do with practical points. Um, the current, uh, all practitioners representing asylum seekers who've traveled to the UK through one or more safe third countries need to be aware that their client's case may be considered for inadmissibility and removal to Rwanda, and that removal to a third country through which the person traveled is also a possibility, although less likely now that the UK is not part of the Dublin Three arrangement. So you've got the current procedure as to how the notice of intent is filed. And as I say, it's critical that, um, that uh, uh, asylum seekers obtain legal representations during that time so that they can urgently ask for more time to make representations which ordinarily would be granted. First priority, is to work out and ascertain why your client didn't claim asylum in a safe third country so that you can make representations as to why it wasn't reasonable to expect them to do so, to use the, the, the language of the test, or why there were, quote, exceptional circumstances. And I've set out a list of common reasons, and I'm not going to go through them because I can see the time, but that, that there are hopefully a few instructive ways in which one can start to think about framing representations. So self-evidently, some of the reasons that I provided when you have a look at them are more compelling than others, but and it's not yet clear because we're in virgin territory, how the reasonable to expect or exceptional circumstances tests will be interpreted in practice. But we should all for the time being argue that these tests are subjective, not objective, and depend on the person's state of knowledge at the time. So for example, if a person genuinely feared that they wouldn't be adequately protected against their persecutors in the third country, this should be re regarded as relevant to inadmissibility, even if the fear is not objectively well-founded. And as I say, med medical legal of evidence is going to be required in virtually every case. As we know, most asylum seekers suffer from PTSD and depression. Some may have other conditions such as learning difficulties, complex PTSD, autism. All of those conditions are potentially relevant to their decision-making, their understanding of the situation that they're in, and the assessment of risk whilst they're in the safe country. And conditions such as PTSD and depression can also have a significant effect on memory, as we know, and recall. And so a medical legal report can help to explain internal inconsistencies and confusion and can bolster credibility. Uh, and, and the point about all that, is, the reason that that's important is because you will often get, from recent experience, you will you'll get points made that you, know, you could well have um, walked into a, uh, the equivalent of the asylum screening unit in whichever country you were in and just make a claim for asylum. Um, and you've got to deal with questions about whether the, the, the power relationship that maybe existed between you and the agent that, that smuggled you in, uh, and, and whether there were things such as constrained agency and so on. Now, that said, some asylum seekers may find it hard to rebut an inadmissibility decision, for example, because they actually did claim asylum in the safe third country. And in that sort of case, the claim is automatically regarded as, as inadmissible and the reasonable to expect test isn't in play. Um, now, in every case, it will be essential to prepare a strong argument as to why the Rwanda um, or any other proposed country of removal isn't a safe country for the particular asylum seeker. 
and why human rights would be breached there. And again, medical legal evidence about their particular vulnerabilities will be critical. So um, having gone through that very quickly, I hope I've managed to alight on most of the kind of cornerstone parts of the new scheme. Um, as I say, the slides will be available afterwards for those who would like it as a reference. And uh, I'm going to pass on to Hannah now. Thank you, Arza. Some of you may have been familiar with the old detained fast track system and would have no doubt welcomed the suspension of that system a few years ago. Unfortunately, um, the Nationality and Borders Act arguably resurrects that old system in the form of accelerated detained appeals. The relevant provisions can be found in section 27 of the 2022 Act. And I should say at this point that um, the, the provisions are not yet in force, uh, but will be brought into effect in due course um, by, by commencement regulations. The accelerated appeals procedure will apply to individuals who are detained under immigration powers and who are appealing a negative decision on their application to the first tier tribunal. So that will include protection and human rights appeals, appeals against deprivation of citizenship, appeal rights in respect of EU citizens, rights immigration decisions, and appeals against EEA decisions. The applicable time limits are strict. Notice of appeal must be given to the first tier tribunal not later than five working days after the Secretary of State has given notice of their decision. And perhaps more starkly, the first tier tribunal must make and give notice of its decision on the appeal, not later than 25 working days after the appeal was lodged. And then any application for permission to appeal either to the first tier tribunal or upper tribunal must be determined by that tribunal um, within 20 working days. As to safeguards, um, section 27.2 provides that the Secretary of State may only certify a decision if uh, the appeal brought would likely be disposed of expeditiously. Um, so you, you may think that that is not much of a safeguard the Secretary of State will in due course publish regulations and guidance on accelerated appeals. And during committee stage, Tom Perslove, then Parliamentary Under Secretary of State for the Home Office, told the Public Bill Committee that through regulations and guidance, cases would be assessed for whether they are likely to be decided fairly within the shorter time frame, and individuals um, would be screened for vulnerability and other factors that may impact their ability to engage fairly with the accelerated process. Um, but we don't have those regulations or that guidance yet. And so the detail remains to be seen. Another safeguard um, in section 27.5 is that tribunal procedure rules must secure that the first tier tribunal or upper tribunal um, may, if it is satisfied that this is the only way to secure that justice is done in a particular case, order that a relevant appeal is to cease to be an accelerated detained appeal. Um, however, uh, we don't have uh, those procedural rules yet, um, so the detail is, um, is unknown at this stage. There are differences between the old detained fast track system and the new accelerated route. The time limits under the new procedure um, are slightly more generous. Um, for example, uh, applicants have five days to lodge an appeal, whereas under the old system, uh, they had only two days. 
However, from what we know about the new accelerated appeals procedure, it, it doesn't appear to overcome the problems identified by the Court of Appeal in the case of the Lord Chancellor and detention action, which found that the old detained fast check rules were unlawful. In that case, Lord Dyson held the time limits were so tight as to make it impossible for there to be a fair hearing of appeals in a significant number of cases. As to practical steps that can be taken if you have a client in detention and you think that there's a risk that they be, might be, end up in the accelerated route at appeal stage, it will be really important to obtain as much corroborating evidence um, as possible at the initial application stage. Um, so in particular, any relevant expert reports uh, because there may well not be time to obtain that evidence at the appeal stage. Expert evidence, for example, medical evidence or trafficking expert reports will also um, be extremely important in, in many cases because that evidence will form the basis of representations that you can make to the Secretary of State um, or to the first tier tribunal that your client's case is not suitable for the accelerated route. Thank you. I'm now going to hand back to Mark, who will um, lead a short question and answer session in the remaining time. Hi there. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us, Raza and Hannah. Um, so uh, the occasional um, question has, has cropped up in the uh, written Q&As, I can see. Um, Mark, there's a question for you from Liz Barrett, which is, do you think, or do you know or think that the different refugee regimes for Group 1, 2 refugees apply to fresh claims, accepted as fresh claims, post 28 June, but where original claim, the original claim was decided before the 28th of June, possibly years ago? I think it's a good question that probably lots of people are faced with. Yeah, okay, so. So where might we find the answer to that question? I asked myself. Um, the most obvious place is gonna be in the, the definition of asylum claim. I have a, conducted a quick review of this because I've been asking it before. And I think it seems to me to be relatively deep water, yeah, <laughs> that we're gonna have to think about quite carefully because the claim, the, the, the definition of claim is found variously <laughs> scattered around a uh, bit of legislation these days. And, you know, we'll have to have a careful think about what is the dominant definition um, of an asylum claim and about whether or not that necessarily cap catches um, the further representations um, definition. So I think what I'm going to say on that one is that we'll do a little, we'll, we'll do a note, and that's Raza uh, has thought about this more, but we might do a little uh, post-session note on that uh, rather than extemporizing on it right now. Yeah, no, I, th I think I think that's the the, the right idea, and, I, and yeah, no, I don't. I certainly think that it is deep water, um, and it's as I say, it's an issue that's probably going to come up for many many people, and it's something that the tribunal is going to have to deal with. I, I know that one of the the, the, the next um, commentator in the Q and A's has in fact said that, um, that, that that this matter is addressed to some degree in in the guidance on further submissions. So at least the home the home office perspective. Is something that we can look up but obviously the home office perspective might or might not be right and it might be litigated whether or not depending on whether or not it's in our um our favor um i've seen a question i saw one of the questions the first question was um how the inadmiss in inadmissibility process relates to differentiation decisions so um i mean the, the inadmissibility process essentially operates to shut out some asylum seekers from the refugee determination system altogether. So in a sense, that's how it, <laughs> whereas the differentiation decisions are only going to impact those people who not only access the system, but are granted refugee status. So in a sense, the relationship in that sense is rather faint. Um, 
I don't know if anyone's got any other comments on that. No, I think that's right. Um, someone in the in, in the Q and A has uh, a person called Kay has said that the Home Office has said that they will, in response, I think, to Liz's question about the fresh claim uh, twenty eight June threshold, the the Home Office has published some guidance on further submissions and say they they will apply it to post twenty eight June further submissions. So. As, as I think, as Mark said, there's been a whole raft in, re in recent times of um, new policy documents. So there's quite a lot to get on top of to give life to the what, what the what the Act purports to say or is going to do. Um, there's there's another there's a couple of questions about safe third country and Schedule Four, and given that it gives the Secretary of State such um, significant discretion or carte blanche to um, do what she wishes. Is it anticipated that challenges on what is considered a safe third state do do we anticipate challenges on what is considered a safe third state given the potential further harm individuals may face well yes i mean i think the answer, straightforward answer is yes but we just don't know where those countries will be in the first place that we've we're dealing with obviously at the moment and over the summer was uh, rwanda and we know obviously in that context the position of lgbtq plus people was particularly pronounced um um, but it's it also, it's going to be a waiting brief, really, isn't it? Because um, at the moment, whatever the court will decide uh, in in those cases, will probably um, fashion the Secretary of State's approach in future cases. And she's no doubt taking steps to try to do to refine what is going on in Rwanda as we speak. Agreed. Yeah. Um... There's a question about um, Ukraine, about, about, about temporary protection under the Ukraine scheme and, and um, indiscriminate violence. Um, so obviously, the, the, the government, the way the government sees Ukrainian cases is that they are to avoid asylum claims at all cost, and that is achieved in some degree by giving them deals. You know, a whole series of immigration routes, um, which give quite lengthy and generous access to. You know, a, a lifestyle that asylum seekers would kill for. Yeah, I mean, right to work and all that. So completely uncontested um, accommodation arrangements. You know, a much broader array of accommodation arrangements available to you. Um, so, in in a sense, that there are obvious reasons why many people would probably sooner go with those preferred schemes than pursue a um, conventional asylum claim. Could, could, could they make a humanitarian protection claim based on indiscriminate violence, i.e. Rule 339, whatever it is of Part 11, the asylum immigration rules? Um, they, they, they've, <laughs> civilians obviously are facing problems in, 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 in parts of Ukraine, many parts of Ukraine. Um, it would be interesting to see whether or not the thinking that uh, rejected the risks to Somalians and Iraqis um, would be applied to the you know to Ukrainian claims, but um, but obviously there are many civilian casualties in Ukraine, and it is it is a classic uh, war where civilians are innocent victims of, of, of conflict. So potentially Article 15C claims, as they were once called, could be pursued. Um, also, don't forget that that inexplicably, Part 11A of the immigration rules addressing temporary protection has been maintained. And temporary protection, which is something that no one ever really looked at because we never, it was never relevant, um, has never historically mattered because it was part of European Union law, hence why it's surprising that they've kept it in the immigration rules. But I'm looking at it in today's immigration rules, happily sitting there online, part 11A, um, because the trigger for it was the council, the European council uh, making a declaration of uh, there being a mass influx of displaced persons, which they never did until Ukraine. So there's this odd bit of what we might style UK U EU retained law, which could also be relied on by Ukrainians now. But again, just like with asylum and humanitarian protection, you know, might might bog you down somewhat. Um, but but yeah, you know, for some, if there are people who for some reason don't qualify for any of the official schemes, as it were, they might want to think about these other possibilities. Yeah. I think, sadly, that's all the time that we have. We've just gone over two o'clock, so it may be that we'll try to deal with any other questions that arise that, that are put into the uh, Q&A box um, in writing later. And there are, have been some helpful follow-ups to a few of the questions that have already been um, 
discussed. So I think um, with, with that in mind, I, I think all that's left to say is to say thank you very much to everyone for attending, uh, especially during your lunch uh, hour. Uh, and as I say, as we all move quite quickly to move through what is an extremely complex and um, but obviously very important piece of legislation, uh, the presentations that will be that we've given will hopefully be circulated to those who would like it afterwards so that you can read them in a bit more detail to digest the, the what's been said. Uh, and uh, we're all very happy to deal with any questions anyone has that arises from what we've discussed today. Um, you'll have the details, I think, for all of us in the information that was circulated earlier and certainly in the presentations, I suspect. Um, so, yeah, from myself, from Mark, from Hannah, uh, we'd just like to thank you, say thank you very much for coming today.